Tech Data launches a government contract exchange program. Dell touts the first enterprise-grade Chromebooks. Pulseways making two-factor authentication mandatory. Opportunities in selling workspaces and much more. It's Channel Pro Weekly, episode 115, The Five Finger Discount. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Channel Pro Weekly, episode 115. My name is Matt Whitlock, technology editor, online director, and host of this fine, fine audio program. Joining me this week and every week, the one, the only, the super amazing executive editor, Rich Freeman. Super amazing. I would have been delighted with amazing. Super amazing. Awesome. It's the super that makes it bigger and better. Yeah. <laughs> so now, Rich, uh, I say this fine audio program, but we didn't say who it's for. And I usually attempt to do that. But Rich, today, because you are super amazing in your own super amazing way, can you explain who this show is for? I, I will, although uh, I will say the pressure is on now. I've got to live up to the super amazing title. But uh, yeah, th this is a program for uh, our readers at Channel Pro, which is to say managed service providers, value-added resellers, system builders, pretty much anybody who is supporting the technology needs of small and mid-sized businesses. And that's a, lot of, that's a lot of people out there, Rich. It is. And there's a lot of people that uh, listen to us each and every week that we put out a show because it's channel pro weekly, but with the caveat and promise that of the 52 weeks in a year, a show will come out in one or more of them. <laughs> exactly. Right. exactly. We, we have, have yet to release an episode that did not appear during a week. Right. That is, that is very true. And uh, so that's our, as our guarantee. And we can always, we can always promise that to our wonderful listeners. Um, we did not do a show last week. Uh, you were on the road and the time slot we had, um, wasn't really just going to work out very well. So, um, but, but, um, here we are this week. Uh, so Rich, why don't you tell us where you were last week and, uh, what was going on? Uh, and this is actually going to figure prominently in this episode. So, um, I spent most of the week, uh, so actually I was in your backyard. I was in Chicago all week. Um, I spent most of the week at the tech data partner summit. Uh, and then I spent last Thursday at the DNH Midwest uh, Technology Conference, although they renamed it a little bit. I think I just got the name wrong, but um, essentially it's the Midwest edition of these uh, regional technology shows that they do during the course of the year. Awesome. So you were, you were in my backyard and we still couldn't act <laughs> together to get a show going. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay. But you know what happens when you're on the road and you get busy and, uh, and yeah, that's just, that's just what happens. Yeah. I know, totally I know it was my fault. No, no, uh, this not, time. I had this one little window, the sliver of time that worked for me and it just wasn't good. It was kind of an unreasonable time for Matt to be recording an episode. So yep, we missed last week. Yeah. Hard time for me with, uh, with the school year back in session. My, I, I happen to like have, have to go pick up my kid like right at that particular time. So, and I didn't have enough time to make alternate arrangements. So, um, couldn't leave, uh, couldn't leave the poor youngster stranded in front of the school. I'm yeah, sure you understand. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I know we have a lot of news to catch up on and a lot of uh, other stories to go through. We also got a museum and a tech pick this week. So we're going to try to give you all a, a full, uh, full episode here, full show, lots to cover, especially with the break last week. Now, Riz, before we get going, though, I do want to highlight that uh, next week is also a probably a week we may not record. <laughs> Just warning for everybody there. But why wait for Channel Pro Weekly when you can go to Channel Pro Weekly. Does that make sense? That doesn't really make sense. No, we are having our live event uh, next week, Rich, in uh, San Jose, California. So if you, if you, rather than wait for us to, you know, to listen to us uh, here on the show, you can just come and meet us in person. How about that? We would love that. We would absolutely love that. Yeah, we are in San Jose next week. Um, Two days, uh, really. There's a, a pre-day activity in, uh, involving... Uh, the 20 and Deep Instinct and the Compliancy Group um, and uh, Citricom, they're uh, hosting an event that folks are welcome to attend. And then next Thursday, September 5th, is uh, the main day of the event. Um, and we're going to have all sorts of great content on expanding your managed services offerings, specializing in cybersecurity. Um, we've got this great session on uh, sales and marketing tips with a sort of competitive uh, aspect to it. People in the audience can win prizes. Uh, our good buddies, Carl and Manuel Palachuk will be back to uh, answer real live questions from people in the audience about uh, 
pain points they're having in, in their business. And uh, you can get some real uh, advice from two experts right there in the room. Uh, and then, of course, Matt, you will be hosting the uh, the latest episode of the uh, the Tech Trends Game Show. Yep, Family Feud uh, style, Tech Trends Feud, I think we call it. Uh, lots of um, lots of fun there, so uh, definitely worth worth coming out and checking that out. But it's a it's a great event. Um, I know we've talked about the event on the lot a lot on the show in the past, but uh, if you if you've never gotten a chance to come out and and see one, uh, don't wait, don't wait. It's it's not only. Um, incredibly informative and very helpful for your business. You will learn a lot. Uh, it's a great use of your time because it's all kind of condensed into one day. It's a single track. Um, and we, uh, we, we don't stop. I mean, it, it rolls and it keeps, it keeps going. We know that you're busy folks, but, um, it's not only informative, but it's also, it's also a good time. We try to make it uh, entertaining and fun and, uh, we, we don't get, any complaints, Rich, I, 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 have we gotten any complaints? I, you always get the feedback forms. I just assume they say wonderful things about me. Yeah, of course. Needless to say. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, if there are any complaints, they're few and far between. Now, I, I, I uh, feel confident in saying that um, we get really, really strong evals from uh, the audience uh, every time we do one of these shows, which is nice. We, we invest a lot of effort in uh, the content that we produce, and so it's nice to know that uh, that content is valuable. It's resonating with people. It is. And it's also important to point out that one of the things that we are known for in the event space is that we have really good food. We really, we really invest a lot into the, uh, into the meals. And so if you're, if you're, if you, if you go and you, you you'll learn a lot, but you'll also, you also eat really good stuff. Come hungry. Come hungry. Yes. Come hungry. Cause, uh, it's, it's all good. So with that said, uh, August, uh September f- uh, 4th and 5th, right? Correct. And all the details are at events.channelpronetwork.com. Uh, San Jose area. Um, so come on, coming out starts early and uh, it's going to be a great day. So Rich, um, let's go ahead and talk about your, a couple of things that from your trip uh, from the, from the event. And we are talking about uh, partner to partner government. Well, that just sounds like it's going to be interesting. Why don't you tell us about it, Rich? <laughs> yeah. So um, tech data uh, had a couple of announcements that they made during their partner summit last week. Um, one of them had to do with some updates that they made to uh, their Cisco ordering portal. And I mean, interesting stuff, but the, uh, the announcement that I wanted to kind of dive into a little bit was this one here, um, which is a new program that they've set up. They call it the contracts exchange program. Um, And so basically the idea is is this. I mean, obviously, there are enormous amounts of money spent on technology by the federal government, state and local governments. It's a huge market. But most of the um, organizations that are doing the buying in that market will only purchase from uh, companies, IT companies that um, have uh, qualified for a certain kind of uh, contract. You, You basically have to have a certain kind of contract status to be eligible to compete for business from uh, these government entities. And it, it takes a long time to, to get that status. It's expensive. Uh, there are ongoing expenses involved in terms of maintaining your status. So lots and lots of our readers really just can't do it. Um, but uh, there are companies out there, obviously, that have uh, acquired these contract vehicles, as they're called. Um, and, uh, you know, they make use of them on their own, obviously. But they, precisely because it costs so much money to get these things, they're always looking for new ways to monetize that investment that they've made. And so it's not unusual uh, these days for somebody who has a contract vehicle to essentially sell access to it to somebody who doesn't have a contract vehicle but wants to compete for government business. And what Tech Data has done with uh, the Contract Exchange Program, or CEP, um, is essentially set up a marketplace where sellers of these contract vehicles can get in touch with people who are looking to buy um, and, you know, the, essentially tech data has systematized this process that was kind of ad hoc and went off and lots of partners didn't even know it was an option for them. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, basically what tech data is hoping it does is open up the government vertical, state, local, federal levels to uh, tons and tons of channel pros to, to SMB resellers who really just can't or, or haven't been able to uh, go after that business in the past. And at the same time, obviously, it's, it's a nice thing for uh, the holders of these contract vehicles who are going to be able to make a little more uh, money on, on the investment that they've made. Um, so interesting new uh, program, I thought. So I, I, I don't know a lot about this. So tell me, you, what does it take to get a contract vehicle? Because it seems like if you are, 
it's not like a certification, is it? To, you know, to go after a government business? How do you get that? Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't know much about the application process myself, but I mean, there is, uh, and I, I should say, it's not like there is a contract, like, you know, what one kind of, uh, certification to use your term that you have to get it, you know, uh, every state has its own. Um, sometimes there are, uh, you know, additional vehicles that you have to get just to sell to a particular school district. And, um, so each of these processes is probably different. They probably have their own set of qualifications and, they just want to uh, get verification from you that you meet those qualifications. But if you, uh, if you have to meet qualifications, then how can you resell it to somebody else who may not have the qualifications? Uh, well, I mean, essentially, uh, you are, well, I don't know. It, it, it's, right, this, it's, yeah, it's very confusing. I think maybe what you're saying is, is like, the, does the contract holder have to be careful of who they resell it to? Cause like, are, are they kind of like, now responsible for whatever happens on their contract vehicle or well, clearly, yeah. it in, a, in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, clearly. So um, they will, I'm sure. And, and again, this is another piece of the process here. I don't know a lot about in terms of how selective, how picky a contract holder typically is in, in terms of who they sell it to. But um, yeah, it is, you know, essentially somebody is piggybacking on their contract status and they don't want to lose that investment that they made. So they will be careful about that. Okay. Um, that makes, that makes more sense. Cause otherwise I'm, I'm sitting here thinking like, yeah, I, I go and I get a driver's license and then I sell my driver's license to somebody else. You know, it's just kind of a weird, yeah. weird thing, but I guess if you're partnering with a partner through your vehicle, I guess. Right. That's, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's partners sharing contract status with other partners. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. That is kind of neat. I wonder how many people are going to take advantage of that. Yeah, I mean, and it's a brand, brand new thing. And right now, there are only two uh, contract holders that are uh, participating in the program. Tech Day is obviously uh, in discussions with a lot more. And over time, they expect it to be a pretty long list. Um, so it, this is definitely in its infancy right now. But yeah, it will be interesting to see what kind of a, uh, an impact that it makes. And um, it's just, you know, it, it's nice, basically, to see a large opportunity opened up to lots more partners this way. Yeah, cool. Um, so I don't have any other questions about that. I think it's cool. We'll put a link to that story in the uh, show notes here on the page. And if you're, if you're watching this, like on uh, YouTube, there'll be a link to it in the discussion area or um, in the description area. Um, so if you're, if, so if you're looking to do get into government verticals and you can't get whatever the qualifications are that you need in order to do that, this might be a, a good way for you to, to dive in and check that out. Um, but, uh, so let's move on to the next story, which is kind of interesting. So Acronis is doing a new security assessment and training and response services, right? What, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this, uh, this kind of came out of the blue and I, I'm not sure it got as much coverage, uh, as it could have or, or should have because Acronis was actually surprisingly, uh, quiet about it from, uh, from my perspective, but they have launched a relatively robust new um, cybersecurity services offering. Um, now, what's interesting about this, we have known all year long, because uh, Acronis has been doing a very good job uh, of sort of setting the stage for this. We've known for months and months now that in October at its first annual uh, global cyber summit event, I believe they're calling it, uh, that Acronis is going to enter the security market in a big way. They're, they're known principally to, they do a number of different things, but they're known principally as a BDR vendor today they are going to be launching a uh, data protection strategy in which they couple BDR with cybersecurity. And we, we've seen this elsewhere in the industry when Carbonite went out and bought WebRoot, very similar thinking. Let's yep. pair up BDR with security. It, it all fits under the, the rubric of uh, data protection. So Acronis is going in the same direction. Um, they have been telling the world this for a long time. And um, the big thing that they'll be announcing in October is the launch of a product called Total Protect, and that's going to be their big um, security suite. What they really haven't been telling folks um, about uh, all year long is that they're also uh, going to be getting into the uh, associated services space. And so that's what they announced last week with the launch of Acronis Cyber Services. Right now, there are three services uh, that they're offering. One of them is uh, an assessment service, so it'll do vulnerability scanning and penetration testing. Uh, they have an end-user security awareness training uh, offer offer in there, and then an incident response 
uh, service in there where they can actually kind of step in and help you uh, deal with a breach after the fact if it happens. Um, so this, this is interesting. I mean, we knew that Acronis was going to be competing with a lot of uh, security vendors out there. Uh, but this just sort of, um, you know, expands the battlefield, uh, if you will, a little bit. I mean, Webroot uh, and Barracuda come to mind immediately as two companies that have security awareness training offerings. Um, you know, there are uh, other companies out there like Breach Secure Now that compete in that space. Um, Rapid Fire Tools is a very well-known name in the assessments market, and uh, Continuum has uh, an offering of its own in, in that area uh, that uh, they've introduced. Uh, within the last year, and so um, Acronis is now going to be uh, going up against not just uh, makers of cybersecurity software, but uh, companies that offer cybersecurity services too. And and I, I think they're well positioned to compete in that market. Acronis is not a not a small name in in BDR, so it's it's a lot of partners that they already have access to 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 jump on board with this. Yeah, you know, and, and what's interesting about that, um, and, and this applies to a, a somewhat different segment, but it, it's very similar to uh, uh, what's going on in the managed services space, like the RMN PSA space, um, where, you know, you've got these companies like ConnectWise and Kaseya and so on, building suites of products. And um, in theory, at least, you know, it's a, similar to what you just said. They, they have this existing customer base, they have well-known brands, they have uh, brand equity and trust that they've uh, developed with MSPs, and so that should, in theory, uh, help them cross-sell. The question is, are MSPs actually willing or, or interested in um, uh, purchasing those tools from one vendor, or do they prefer a best-of-breed kind of approach? And that's going to be the dynamic that Acronis is going to have to deal with. So they do have that advantage in terms of being a well-known company, um, having lots of partner relationships. And so, you know, certainly having the opportunity to talk to a lot of partners about their security offerings. What will be interesting to see, what's hard to predict is, um, are those partners, do, do they like the uh, sound of sourcing more of their solutions from one supplier? Or do they sort of feel like, you know, I, I love your BDR stuff, Acronis, but I love the security stuff I'm using today and I'm going to stick with it. Well, that's actually an interesting question because what I'm sitting here thinking is, is that it, there's a little bit of inherent risk building so your own solution. That's why a lot of these companies are buying other, other already established and well-known solutions and then just snapping them together. So do you think there's a risk here with the Cronus not going out and just trying to find some company already doing this that already is established in that market? I, I guess we, we would have to know just how expensive it was basically to to create their own stuff as opposed to going out and and, uh, and buying somebody. I mean, um, I, I'm sure it took them longer. Um, you know, like you know, Carbonite cut a 600 plus million dollar check, and they had uh, a security suite. Uh, they, had, they had a trusted security suite. This is new, right? Like, right. who knows how well this works? No, that's a good point. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, and they're going to have to uh, to win that trust the way Webroot already has. Yeah, well, so we'll have to see if it was, if it paid off or not to to go your own. Usually, I, I usually think it is, um, but you know, hopefully, it works as well as uh, they they say and does a good job. And if and if it does, I mean, Acronis is already pretty well respected anyway, so I think people are probably going to be willing to give them the benefit of the doubt at least a little. Enough maybe to kick the tires. Yeah. 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 I think so. Um, speaking of, speaking of kicking tires, um, the, my kid has a Chromebook and sometimes we want to kick that thing uh, pretty <laughs> really? hard. And, uh, Dell, but Dell is, is all in on notebooks you want to kick. <laughs> yeah, I'm teasing. Actually, although that thing is uh, kind of a pain sometimes, but, uh, but Dell's got, business ready latitude Chromebooks uh, that they're doing and something with, uh, with, with SD WAN. Tell me, tell me about that. So this, you know, it's obviously the big uh, uh, news source this week, if you will, um, has been uh, VMworld, VMware's annual event. Uh, and there's been news from VMware um, uh, out of that, or really they uh, uh, announced most of that last week, but, uh, VMware has, has had uh, news, VMware partners have had news, 
Uh, and one of those partners, Dell, um, had a number of different things that they were talking about. And one of them was uh, the launch of this new SD-WAN uh, product that you were alluding to there, um, which is combines their own Dell EMC hardware uh, of various kinds um, with uh, some of their own software and a lot of VMware uh, software, VMware cloud software. And it, it's um, actually kind of a nice bundle pre-assembled kind of um, uh, SD-WAN uh, environment in a box. Uh, but uh, the, the other announcement that they made this week that I, I had a hunch would be of interest to you was that they have launched the first, now th this is their first, but they're saying it's the first in the industry. And I, I haven't really kind of looked around to verify that. The very first um, Chromebook Enterprise devices. Now about two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, I think, um, Google introduced Chrome Enterprise, so a sort of business-oriented, business-specific um, version of the Chrome operating system. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly how long, but they've certainly been talking about um, the eventual introduction of Chromebook Enterprise devices that are set up to run um, the Enterprise edition of Chrome. Um, these two new devices that Dell launched this week are supposedly at least the very first two Chromebook Enterprise uh, laptops on the market. And uh, one of them is a, a sort of standard clamshell. The other is a, a two-in-one uh, with a fold-back screen. Um, both of them uh, were launched in conjunction with some updates that Dell made to its unified workspace uh, platform, which is uh, something that they've been talking about since uh, or launched in April. And they made some enhancements to that uh, platform during VMworld. And they're kind of saying, you know, you can um, hook up these Chromebook Enterprise uh, devices to the unified workspace, and it, it all kind of um, fits together as a very easy way to support a variety of users and a variety of operating systems with any kind of combination of uh, hosted applications that you want. Um, but what, what's interesting about, you know, we, there are obviously tons of Chromebooks on the market right now. Chromebooks have been around for a long time. It's a growing market. Um, it's chiefly been a consumer and an education market uh, up until this point. There is definitely business usage, but not enormously so. These two Chromebook Enterprise devices are actually part of Dell's Latitude line. So Dell has sold Chromebooks for, I don't know how long, time. but yeah. they've all been in their own sort of bucket somewhere. Now there are two Chromebooks within the Latitude line, and the Latitude line obviously is a very well-known um, business laptop uh, portfolio that De Dell has had for a long time. And so what they're saying is, um, these products combine the, uh, the battery life and the portability kinds of advantages that Chromebooks offer with some of the durability and the performance and the security that people associate with the, uh, the Latitude name. So um, again, a, a, another area where we'll see um, how big an impact this uh, makes, whether having uh, access to a business grade Chromebook, if you will, uh, increases uh, sales of Chromebooks in the business world, and do the Lenovo's and HP's of the world follow suit? Um, but uh, but at, at a minimum, a, a very interesting product launch. Well, that's what we're going to have to see. Uh, Chromebook is, as you said, pri primarily uh, an education and home play. Um, so so channel channel partners who are selling Chromebooks are likely selling them to schools. Um, I, I mean, you're right. I, I can't think of any other business-oriented uh, Chromebooks out there. So these probably are the first. I mean, there's an argument he made, you know, for Google's own uh, Pixel that that might be an enterprise-grade, business-grade product. It's certainly priced that way, um, but it's also a more. It, it could also be a premier. I don't, nobody's buying that for the for home use. So it's probably a. That's probably you could say that's a business one too. But I don't know. These are kind of these are kind of pricey. Um, I'm starting to wonder when you start outfitting Chromebooks with this kind of hardware. So we're talking, you know, Core i5, eight gigs of RAM, 256 gig SSD. I'm starting to wonder how how much the battery argument starts to make sense here. Um, did they did they give any indication of, of like how many hours they say it runs? Uh, if probably somewhere in there and not in the press release, um, possibly up on the website, but I, uh, I didn't come across it. Um, yeah, I, I did not, I didn't see a, I didn't see a number either, but you know, I'm sitting here thinking this is, this is, uh, if you're, if you're a, an enterprise completely tied into G suite and, um, 
this this would probably make sense for a business deployment, but I don't know how many companies exclusively use G Suite and nothing else, right? There's there's a lot of other business software that the, a lot of companies need. So it's diff, it's difficult to say. And also the pricing on these are you know seven hundred to not you know starting at seven hundred dollars for the clamshell, starting at a little over eight for the uh, for the two in one. So and I'm sure as you can figure, they're going to get, get higher and higher. I'm just, it's a hard, it's a hard one. Well, and remember that they, um, this launch came um, in conjunction with, it was connected from Dell's perspective with this, uh, the enhancements to unified workspace. So I think, you know, they're viewing these devices as thin clients, essentially. So, I mean, they, they may or may not, um, view them as an option for any laptop user out there. But if somebody has um, embraced a, a VDI, a virtual desktop kind of strategy, uh, where they're going to be providing cloud workspaces and they don't need, want the full scale kind of laptop experience, that's probably the market segment that they're going Poss- in. Possibly, possibly. But if, you, if, if you're going to do everything VDI, virtual desktop, these are way overpowered for that, right? These are these are Core i5 eight gig machines. You don't need that to run VDI. Uh, yeah, but they're also great laptops. Also, they're also pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they're very businessy. I don't. Know. I mean, they're nice looking. I, we'll see. I don't. I don't see the. I don't see it. I mean, I, I think. I think if 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 they're pushing unified workspace, and. Uh, G Suite and our, in our, I think these are these are too much, in my opinion. I think they should have tried to to, to get the pricing down, uh, and you know with AMD or i3 kind of stuff, maybe even Pentium level processors, four gigs of RAM, and I mean two hundred fifty six gig. You don't need that much for a Chromebook. Everything's in, everything's cloud based. So hey, you got to cut, cut the hat price in half but with a good quality build. And I think, I think they would be more onto something. My opinion. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we shall see. We shall see. You're usually right. I'm usually wrong. Not when it comes to hardware though. I'm right. A lot of the times. I was going to say, yeah. (laughs) So we'll see. see. (laughs) I'm not the guy to trust on hardware questions. (laughs) Well, but if they deploy it, if they deploy them, hopefully their employees won't kick them. Yeah, because <laughs> they're 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 not soccer balls or tires, and uh, they are they are still computers. Um, but it'll be mandatory. No mandatory kicking though. But you know what else? What else is becoming mandatory? Rich is two factor authentication uh, from Pulseway, and they're going to make you use it. Yeah, it, it, interesting uh, story. It kind of points to a much bigger uh, uh, story, and that's kind of why I, I chose to highlight it here. So um, last week, Pulseway uh, officially announced something that they had been quietly uh, announcing to their partners for a little while. So Pulseway, for people who are not familiar with this company, um, they make a suite of uh, RMM and PSA software. They've got uh, antivirus and, and backup. So it's a whole kind of managed services suite, definitely a smaller player um, in the market. Um, but a, a, an interesting product line worth checking out. It, it's truly compared to uh, a lot of the other names in the market, a mobile first kind of experience. It was invented, to, you know, really to run well uh, on a smartphone or a tablet or something like that. But what they announced last week is they are making um, two factor authentication for logging into that system available to their partners. Now, this, this is sort of a three-step process that they have in mind here. So today, basically, if you wish to enable two-factor authentication, which they strongly encourage you to do, um, you have the ability to do that. Starting very soon, I think just within a matter of weeks, um, the administrator of uh, a Pulseway deployment is going to be able to require uh, that all of the technicians who use the system employ two-factor authentication. And then down the road a little bit, Pulseway itself is going to make two-factor authentication mandatory um, for all of its partners. Um, and the reason, you know, they, they're doing this is, is pretty clear. We, we know we've spoken on the podcast in the not-too-distant past about the fact that MSPs are very much in the crosshairs um, by uh, cyber thieves and, and hackers these days. Hackers have figured out that if you can get into the RMM system, that's going to provide you access to 
you know, tens, dozens, hundreds of um, uh, other users out there. It's this sort of treasure trove of uh, very valuable information for a hacker. And so, you know, hackers are going after MSPs to a much greater extent uh, right now. And it, it's a big enough phenomenon that the federal government warned MSPs about it uh, not too long ago. And um, all of the big uh, makers of RMM and PSA software are aware of it and are dealing with it. And in fact, today, I mean, later today, I will be writing a story about something that ConnectWise announced uh, just this morning, basically, where they're setting up, let's get the terminology right, they have created a uh, information sharing and analysis organization um, and this is a, a kind of organization that um, it exists in other corners of the IT world. But the idea basically is it's a, a consortium of companies that um, all do something similar and agree to share threat intelligence so that everybody can protect their customers that much more effectively. And uh, ConnectWise is setting up something like that for the managed services world. Um, and that and this, this Pulseway announcement, and the fact that Pulseway feels like they need to make this mandatory really does point to um, the seriousness of this issue right now where um, MSPs are being targeted. Uh, and it's, I mean, it, it's a big risk, obviously. If you get breached, if your uh, end users get compromised as a result of that, it, it could be an existential issue for, uh, for your business. So, I mean, I, I think um, it, in a lot of ways, this is really just the, uh, the tip of the iceberg. I've already, you know, reported just in the last few months on steps that data was taking, um, steps that ConnectWise is taking in terms of how they develop their products that are very much oriented or, or um, uh, responding to this, this threat uh, out there. And I think um, there's gonna be more coming. I think you'll see more two-factor authentication and things like that, and more steps made uh, taken by all of these uh, RMM and PSA uh, companies to, uh, to protect those platforms. It's, it's good to offer it. I'm glad they're enhancing it. Um, I think MSPs should use it. I don't think, I don't think the vendor should dictate how somebody wants to run their business. I don't think it should be mandatory. Not, ven not, not dictated by the vendor. I don't think the vendor should dictate, dictate it's, that it's mandatory. I think that's a mistake. and I think that's going to turn people off and, and it's going to make some people go elsewhere. That's my thinking. Yep, I, I don't know. I don't know. But um, uh, on the, you know, looking at it selfishly from Pulseway's point of view, so far they say none of their um, customers has been breached, um, and which is not something that a lot of you know bigger names in the market can say. They obviously uh, want to keep it that way. So from their perspective, this is how you do that. Um, but it's an inconvenience. It's an inconvenience to pe to to people. Um, yeah. And also making, making it making it mandatory authentication though. What's that? I, I, I don't think of it as an inconvenience. I think of it as something that everyone really ought to be doing, especially with an RMM system. I, I can see how some people just don't like being pushed around by anyone, you know, especially a company they're paying money to. And so I I, I could see, you know, to your point earlier that people could be put off by this. Don't don't tell me how to run my business, Paul Sway. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't feel um, like they're imposing a nuisance on people. I think what they're, they're imposing a best practice that people really ought to be utilizing anyway. Sure. Sure. But they're still imposing it. And it is an, it is an inconvenience. It is an inconvenience rather than just logging into something to have to pick up your phone, open up an authenticator app uh, and type in another code every single time you log in. I mean, and the thing is, is in, in, how many, how many, how many services do you use, Rich, where you have two factor authentication? Uh, I'm just going to go, I, I, I don't know. Exactly. I'll say half a dozen. Half a dozen. So six. How often do you log into those? Uh, that's a good question. I know it, it varies. Um, uh, you know, some of them let me stay logged in for a while. Some of them it's every day. Uh, so it, it varies. I, I, you know, it's probably not, I know it's not every day for all of them. It's, it's rarer that I have to keep doing that all the time. Yeah. So imagine, imagine a world where every single time you have to log into anything, you have to grab your phone. That would be a big inconvenience. Don't you think? Wouldn't it be nice to have the choice, the choice? And I, I, look, I don't want to make an argument for, for bad security practices. If you're an MSP and this is, this is an RN, RMM, and uh, it's connected to your clients, you really should be smart and be using it. 
but I still think m- imposing it without uh, imposing it and making it mandatory, I think is a, is a mistake. And I, I would just say if it is, and it might end up being a mistake for them. If it is, it'll just be because they've alienated their, their customers. I mean, from a security standpoint, I don't think it's a mistake. And I don't. No, no, it's not a mistake from a security standpoint. Not at all. It's a mis- I think it's only a mistake that um, they are not giving their users choice. Choice is important. Okay. Um, but I, I guess my point with the security thing was just to say, I, because it isn't a mistake from a security standpoint, um, from my perspective, then I, I sort of, that cancels out the nu- nuisance uh, issue to me. It's something that, especially, you're, you know, we're, we're talking about other people's data here um, that you as an MSP are protecting. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, that, that none of that means that, um, uh, MSPs won't agree with you essentially that it's a nuisance. I don't want to deal with it. I don't need to deal with it. And why are you telling me to do it false way? So, um, we'll just have to kind of see. We will have to see, but I, I got an idea though. See, the problem is, is that they're going to make this mandatory and then another company is going to come out and they're going to say, we got it figured out tri-factor authentication right so not only do you have have to have a password you got to use the authenticator and it's going to email you a code and you got to do all three in 30 seconds are you concerned we're on a slippery slope (laughs) no i just i think that would be a good way to to uh if i was a competitor of pulseway i would come out with Tri-factor Ooh, authentication. Two-factor authentication, slackers. <laughs> so we got quad traffic. <laughs> and this is how we all ended up with five blades on our razor, right? So, <laughs> right. Remember the uh, there was a there was a long time ago. It was a an SNL skit or one or, or one of those other comedy shows at the at the time, and they were making fun of that because I think they just came out with like the Mach three or something like that, or the Mach four or whatever whatever it was, and they like came out with like the Mach twenty seven. And it was like this ridiculous razor that was like this tall and just lined with blades. <laughs> there is a, there is a, a point of where it becomes ridiculous. Yeah. Two factor authentication is not ridiculous. No. It's something that you should be doing. I, I also think that business, those who are managing other people's data should have a, an option on what their practice is going to be for, for staying secure. So, um, but that's just a, a little minor thing here because I don't like being dictated how to do things by companies that I buy services from. So, um, so, but it's good, you know, it's good for security. You know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. You shave with a, did you, do you shave with a Mach 27, Rich? No, I, I settle for a mere uh, three blades. The, the, uh, the old three, not the fusion five. No, no, I, I drew the line at three blades. I'm good there. <laughs> You're good. Good with three. Three is the yeah. magic number. Maybe like with authentication, two is the magic number. Right. With fingers, it's ten. Ten's the magic number of fingers. <laughs> I tell you. But you know what? We're gonna get past this, and then it's all gonna go. I don't know. Biometric. Right. And, you know, codes via carrier pigeons. <laughs> That'd be good. That'd be a good service. Secure security via carrier pigeon. Well, it makes a little old with the new. Be some interesting uh, man in the middle opportunities there potentially, but uh, yeah, no. I, yeah. I oh, oh, look at this! I was just looking at our next story. Surprise, surprise, Rich. What were we just talking about the other day? Yeah, yeah, and exactly. Look what is coming to fruition. I knew you were going to appreciate this for that very reason. <laughs> um, so yeah, our, our next story here has to do with AdTran. Um, they, uh, they just recently held their, uh, annual user and partner event. Unfortunately, uh, the, the team here at Channel Pro is not, uh, available to attend that. The conference calendar is so incredibly crowded that, that we were all over the place. We couldn't send anybody to that show this year, but I did get an opportunity to speak, um, with, uh, Megan Sawyer, one of their, uh, executives by phone after the show. And, uh, she provided some briefings on a number of different things that they announced during the conference, one of which I knew Matt would be of interest to you because we had been speaking recently um, about a new, uh, and we talked about it on the podcast too, we, we talked about this new line of switches from Zizel that were specifically engineered for the video surveillance space and um, you know, higher power over ethernet budgets and, and just all the things, longer ranges on cable runs and things like that, all the things that you would need 
or want in a switch that's going to be used in a video surveillance environment that isn't necessarily there on an off-the-shelf switch that's just going to be used in an, uh, an ordinary office environment. And by golly, here's AdTran, and, and they have a new product that they just introduced that pretty much does, or at least goes after that same uh, market, that same opportunity. It's called the um, SBX 8110, 8110 family, and uh, like the Zytel products, uh, increased uh, POE budget. Um, uh, just trying to see, see if there's anything else in there that's very specific to the uh, use case. Not so much, but um, gigabit Ethernet, uh, built-in um, QoS, comes in 824, 48-port configurations. But uh, the significance here is just as we were saying, um, you know, we, we, you in particular were predicting that there would be other hardware makers, other networking vendors out there that would do something similar to what Zizel did uh, in the video surveillance space. And um, I think it's safe for both of us to predict video surveillance isn't where this ends. Um, there are other markets, and, and the folks at Zizel were already talking about VoIP as one of them, where there are some unique requirements. Maybe there's a market for a unique kind of switch. Um, so this is just another sign that that kind of product um, is going to be uh, on the way in, uh, in in bigger numbers. Absolutely, especially as we start diving into like the whole Internet of Things and um, uh, all of the the weird little devices that you might end up putting into a small office or a factory. All of those are going to be ripe for purpose built switching um, and purpose built networking because they, they all have any, any time where there's something that you, it might make it unique in need. I think you're going to see switch. And I, I, this, I, I, when, when Zizel did it, I'm like, I, I think I said, this is the tip of the iceberg. We're going to see more, more switches like this. Um, and I know you said that I just like saying it again to kind of toot my own horn a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're going to, we're, de we're definitely going to see a lot more, um, a, a shift from generic switching, you know, where you kind of have the kitchen sink into a switch. Uh, I don't want to say the kitchen sink because this, this adds stuff that you don't normally see in, in office switching, but you're going to start to see switches that are, are definitely more specific to the kinds of things you're going to be plugging into them. And it, it seems like, I mean, you know, from a product development standpoint and from the buyer's uh, standpoint as well, it seems like a good thing, a smart thing kind of all around. I mean, the, the, the market logic of that from a, a hardware maker's uh, point of view is, is uh, pretty obvious. But uh, if you're somebody who's selling video surveillance solutions uh, to your customers, I would think having access to something that, uh, you know, essentially... Uh, ease of some of the headaches that you probably have to deal with on a regular basis in terms of, you know, how often you've got to uh, accommodate for long distance cable runs and, and, you know, the uh, insufficient power over ethernet. Uh, oh, yeah, just not having to put in extra power over ethernet injectors is a great, yeah. is a great you reason know. to spend a little extra few bucks on this and not have to have five injectors that you might have to worry about failing or going offline or whatever. Right. Yeah. And the, the frame and, you know, and as we go into quality and QoS stuff, cause it talks a little bit about this here, when we're talking about VoIP and um, wireless type of uh, applications that you can start tuning the quality of service engines for these switches very, very specifically um, for certain kinds of data um, rather than, and, and it, rather than have a switch trying to deal with everything, you know what I mean? So we'll see, we'll see. I, I think it's, I think it's cool. I think it's a great evolution in switches and uh, something that partners definitely need to know about. And, a, and probably a sign of things to come. Yes, that it is indeed. Um, so with that said, uh, they're nice looking switches too. If you, if you, we'll put a link again, like all the links to everything we talk about are going to be on the show notes page on the website. So channel network.com find the, uh, the show sheet for episode 115. And you'll get links to all the stories and stuff we're talking about, but they, they look nice. Um, we gotta get more pictures, Rich. We need more pictures. Where? Just in, in uh, this, we have the little tiny picture in the story. We need lots of big pictures <laughs> in the stories. Cause those are beautiful switches. Look at all the ports. You gotta love looking at this many ports. <laughs> I, I know you do. 
<laughs> what, are you, what are you trying to say, Rich? <laughs> I, this is not the first time that we have talked. You, you, you have uh, waxed poetic uh, about a switch with many ports. It's, it's a, just a sight to see. I know. It, it really is. All them, all them uh, Ethernet jacks ready and waiting. Switches are like black magic voodoo products. They, what they do is absolutely amazing. And they don't get any credit. So I, I just think it's kind of kind of neat. That's all. All right. Um, we've, got, we've got lots of other stories to talk about, uh, but I think that kind of wraps up the news part of the show. Uh, so we, were, we are going to switch gears and talk about uh, Tech Data again. They are switching... <laughs> I love this. I love this kind of marketing jargon stuff that they do. Uh, switching from transform to perform. Indeed. Yeah. So th- th- this is sort of, you know, uh, uh, an overview piece from that Tech Data Partner Summit that I went to last week. Uh, and that was sort of the, the, the big takeaway in terms of, you know, their messaging to, uh, to their partners. Um, and, and I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I don't know if they would agree with this necessary, but it felt a little bit to me like they were kind of putting a bow on what has been the tech data story for a couple of years now. So, you know, they, they went out and they bought um, uh, Avnet Technology Solutions. So the, the solutions arm of uh, Avnet, one of their big competitors, and Avnet was going all in on uh, Internet of Things. They didn't really need that uh, technology solutions business anymore. So. It, you know, it, it, uh, they collected $2.6 billion and, and tech data sort of set itself down this path where they went from really just being a distributor of shrink wrapped products to being a company that can offer solutions in next generation markets like uh, IoT, but, you know, cloud computing and uh, cybersecurity as well. And I mean, it's been this multi year. Uh, transformation process for them ever since, kind of reinventing the business for the next generation uh, of IT. And what they were telling uh, attendees at the Partner Summit last week basically is mission accomplished, essentially. They didn't use those words, but I mean, you know, we're out of the transform phase. We're into what uh, Marty Bauerlein, uh, their uh, SVP of North American Sales said, is perform mode now. Now it's all about, we've laid in the foundation, we've established these uh, business units around the the specific markets that we've decided we're going to target. We've created uh, Practice Builder, which is this whole sort of operation they have that teaches uh, traditional resellers how to be solution providers. Instead, we've we've created the the foundation for where we want to go as a company. And now it's really just about um, picking up the pace, accelerating, doing more, better, what have you about performing against that uh, plan as opposed to actually rebuilding the business. So feels a little bit like a pivot point for uh, uh, tech data now where they they've completed this transform process. They're into perform mode now, and um, it'll be interesting to kind of watch them uh, uh, build out and kind of expand out some of these offerings that, uh, that they've created, which is one of the things that they were kind of talking about at, at the conference is just, uh, um, some of the things that they've been doing in recent months to scale up uh, things like their solutions factory, for example, which is this this methodology they use to create pre-assembled solutions that a partner can uh, just kind of pick up off the shelf and sell to their customers in, in many cases. Uh, so yeah, transform to perform that. And also unlearn yesterday, break through tomorrow. Which was the motto. Uh, it was all over the signage and the posters and what have you for the uh, partner summit. What, how do you unlearn yesterday? Explain that process to me, please. Uh, you know what? I, I don't work for tech data. You'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, actually, we're, we're right on the air now. You can pick up the phone and call them and have them explain to us uh, how one unlearns yesterday. But uh, <laughs> clearly, clearly, we know what, the, uh, what they're talking about there, which is just... Uh, not doing business the old old school way anymore and finding some uh, finding tomorrow's way of doing business uh, essentially yeah yeah they've been building to this for a while um and i know we've had some interesting discussions about some of these distributors and how they're like they, they don't want to be distributors anymore um and, and i i agree there's 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 uh there is a lot of change that's happening um the way the way partners need to approach it selling. Um, 
You know, the interesting. I, I, found, I found something very interesting here, Rich. Thirty-seven point two billion dollars in revenue. Um, are are the distributors really trying to become the the you know the cent, the central point of all business IT? Does that make sense? Kind of. Uh, uh, well, what do you mean? Uh... Because the answer is probably yes, but I, but what what uh, what do you have in mind? I don't know. I'm trying. I'm trying to. It seems like the more I I feel I may, may, uh, maybe I maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we are at a point where the distributors could end up making this so turn everything so turnkey that they wouldn't need partners anymore. A, f- a future, a future where business, why don't businesses, businesses just go to tech data and get their stuff? So this, is, you know, and this is the, uh, the uh, speculation or the, or the idea that comes up in relation to, you know, Microsoft say uh, all the time, like, you know, are, are we headed to a day when they don't need partners anymore? You can just, buy office 365 or whatever it is directly from microsoft and uh, what do you need the partner for um i think um i think uh i I can't envision a future anytime you know reasonably soon where that's the case i can certainly imagine a future in which artificial intelligence say has gotten so advanced that you can you as a business owner can have a conversation with a chat bot essentially about your business and you know, giant servers on the back end are going to figure out what your business needs are and configure everything perfectly. I, but I, for the foreseeable future, I think um, SMBs are really going to need to sit down with a person who understands their business, their market, their vertical, and so on, and and will play a, an indispensable role in this process. I think you know the tech datas of the world and the Ingram Micros and the Synapses and so on. Um, you know, certainly have the opportunity to provide more and more of what that end user consumes. And we've talked about, you know, implementation services like lifecycle services and uh, um, certain forms of consulting, uh, you know, uh, that are part of the sales process and so on. So I I certainly um, think the distributors would like and, and are arming themselves, preparing themselves to to play a bigger role um, in uh, in the services portion of a, a partner's relationship, but I think it'll be a while um, before partners become obsolete. I, a while. I, here, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to think through this in my head, and I I, I always go long term, doom and gloom kind of thinking. But it it seems to me that one of the primary purposes of a channel partner was to was to listen to somebody's business and know all of the different pieces that they needed to snap together to make something work. But the distributor is doing all the snapping now, right? Like they, they've, they've already done all the snapping and put all of the the things together. And it seems to me that businesses could easily conform to the box, to the, whatever the config, you know, the doctor's office in a box, right? I mean, Every, you know, I, it seems like you, you could, you, people do, th- this is like this in uh, the consumer space with lots of stuff, right? Like you kind of know what you need. You go to the, you go to the Best Buy or you go to the appliance store or you go to whatever. And there it is like, you know, uh, the baking, baking kit, you know, ba- you want to bake a cake. So you need all, you get all this stuff to bake a cake while well, you go and this is the cake baker's kit. And then you just work with the, with, with the, with the stuff that's in there. I just, I just feel like at some point the value of the partner was to know all of the different things that you had to put together. But if, if the big box d- distributor or solution provider, if you will, is the, is tech data and they've got all this stuff going, why not just say, here's doctor's office in a box. Yeah. But I mean, it, it, you know, when we attach that in a box label to some of these, I mean, it's not literally like you flip the switch and you go. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. It could be that easy. Right. Well, I doubt it. No. I mean, you know, cause the businesses have um, their own particular workflows and, and uh, you know, uh, needs and requirements uh, essentially. So there, there's almost always 
uh, you know, configuration and customization and so on that a business is going to, to need, even with these pre-assembled solutions. So in, in a way... But, that, but that's the question, though. Is, is there a point where we shouldn't, that where businesses will turn and they will say, we no longer expect the software to conform to us. We will conform, like Pulseway, we will conform to what they say the best practices is. So we will transform our business to work with whatever the solution is, not the other and way around. Why would they do that? Because it'll cost less. And, and so the thought is that that could end up becoming universal, essentially. I mean, you know, if you give people the option of just take it or leave it for half the price, there are probably some companies out there that will say, yeah, okay, you know, we'll, we'll adapt our workflows to, to this if it's going to save us that much money. But I, I don't know. Is that, I, I think a lot, I, I, I think a, a lot of small businesses would do that. If it was half the cost, are you kidding? They'll figure They'll figure out how to, how to adjust their flows to whatever, whatever the software says is the best way to do it for a doctor's office or a gas station or a, a front end office or, or, or a school. Right. I, I am, I'm more skeptical of their willingness to do that and more skeptical of the wisdom of doing that at a time when um, business leaders, the, 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 you know, the better ones, the smarter ones are sort of realizing that technology is how you differentiate and how you compete and how you win. The idea of kind of, you know, deciding that to save money, I'm going to eliminate differentiation and just do this the same way everybody else does it. I, I wonder if that's really a, a smart way to go. Yeah, but I don't know the end. How many, how many end users of doctor's offices differentiate themselves by the EMR, or the electronic medical record, EMR? You do the right one. The EMR and the flows of their, of, and how that works. How, how, many, how many doctor's offices differentiate their business by that? Uh, I mean, probably plenty. I don't know. I, I so? yeah, probably. I don't know. I'm not really sure. I'm not convinced, Rich. <laughs> Interesting discussion, though. Hey, uh, listeners slash viewers, what you guys? You guys are the front line in this. Do you find that your customers demand that the technology solutions evolve or, or get? are flexible enough to, get, to conf be configured to exactly how they want to do things? Or do you, do you kind of listen, pick a solution that you know works for doctor's offices and just make them conform to it? I'm curious, right? I, 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 of course, I'm like stuck on a doctor's office. It's the one example I can think of, but. Yeah, well, I mean, you there's know. There's lots of solutions like that in some ways a better example because there there are real world sort of um tie-ins to it is uh let, let's just say crm right um where sale you know the the big breaking factor on uh the growth of salesforce right now is that they can't literally cannot find enough partners to go out and do this kind of customization that we're we're talking about here that you know that taking the out of the box product and turning it into something that's specific to a, an individual business. So, so the question is just, you know, from a long-term perspective, well, no, actually the, that isn't the question. I was going to say the question is, can the Salesforce product become smart enough to do that on its own? The, the question you're raising essentially is do customers stop wanting customization someday? Um, and I, again, I. Well, what I'm saying, so, so let's say tech, so let's say a distributor can, can, pre-configure and pre pre-bundle in a CRM, a, what are the various things that business, I'm sure they have all this other the business uses, you know, office 365 or G suite or whatever. And, um, all, all of these different components and just say install and it were, you know, it were, I, I don't know how, I don't know how custom is, uh, how customized they have to make these things, I guess. It, so. So, yeah, but I mean, imagine a scenario where um, you believe at least that the, the magic that makes you successful as a business is the incredible um, customer support that you provide. Um, and, and you have a particular way of doing that. You, you have, you know, create, built an organization in a particular way and, and um, 
you have your own special way of providing support that you think differentiates you from uh, and, and you have found through your success differentiates you from uh, other companies out there. And now what you're essentially saying is, hey, I'm going to save you a lot of money, but you need to stop doing all that and provide support the way this product tells you to provide support. You'll save a lot of money, but you have to kind of give up the thing that you invested a whole bunch of uh, effort in creating that has helped make you make you what you are. I suppose it depends on the type of solution, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because if if you're if you're if you provide support and a tool goes to the opposite of how you provide support, I can see how that could be a problem, right? But there are lots of other technology implementations in business that I I wouldn't say is like functioning in a way that's core to what their business does, right? That yeah. they could probably alter their practices too. And, and you know, I was going to say before, I mean, th- this all sort of um, uh, ties into a much larger theme right now which is this idea in the industry that a lot of what uh, our readers have done to make money for many years is becoming commoditized and automated. If not, you know, today, immediately, then it's coming soon. And the partners uh, out there today who endure and and thrive in that environment are going to be the ones who sort of move up the value stack, right? And get into some of those higher order parts of the business where they're really providing strategic consulting and business process optimization and some of that stuff that is, harder to do in a lot of ways, but also more profitable uh, as a result. And I mean, in essence, that's kind of what we're talking about is that some solutions out there where there really isn't maybe that much variation in terms of how businesses use them uh, could, you know, become something that isn't going to be terribly lucrative for channel pros down the road. But, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it, it, for me, at least it's hard to imagine uh, you know, a distributor or a, an ISV, a, a software maker, you know, not needing partners whatsoever for anything that you know any of their solutions do someday maybe down the road but it it's a long ways off i think good well that's good news for our listeners in particular and for us because and for know, us yes you know, they go away where do we go so. <laughs> <laughs> that'll give everybody uh, a little bit of swagger in their step over the weekend knowing that they're going to be employed for a while longer. And uh, they're not the only ones. DNH has some swagger in their step, as you, as you said. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I spent a day at their, uh, their Midwest Technology Conference and uh, had a chance to sit down with uh, Peter DeMarco, who is their uh, vice president of VAR sales, and Jason Weistrack, who, uh, who joined the company uh, at the beginning of the year and runs their cloud business now. And... Um, uh, attended some sessions there, and I, it, you know it was just interesting. And th- this goes back in, in March. I attended their West Coast uh, technology show. So this is the second DNH conference I've been to this year, and both times I kind of came away from the event with this sense that you know there is this newfound kind of confidence um, over over there at DNH. Now this is a company that's over a hundred years old. Um, they have certainly not been anyone's idea of a struggling business for a, a long, long time. It's not like, you know, they're, this is some comeback story or whatever. But it, it does feel like there's this extra kind of confidence in the way that they talk to their partners uh, and even to the media about what it is that, that they're doing right now. And, um, and I, mean, I asked them about that directly, and they basically said, yeah, you know, what we're doing right now is working for us, and you're probably picking up on that, that, that kind of success will lead to a certain amount of swagger in your step, if you will. And what they're doing, basically, is they're, um, it's very similar in, in uh, some ways to tech data. They're, they're identifying strategic markets where what the end user is looking for is a solution as opposed to a product. Um, and they're kind of doubling down uh, in there and really um, coming to their partners with offers that are designed to make it easier to provide a complete solution. So um, just you know, within the last few, uh, well, last few weeks, really, uh, uh, DNH introduced a, a whole new cloud marketplace for their cloud business. And I mean, all the distributors and lots of other independent companies, you know, there, there are plenty of cloud marketplaces out there. What's a little bit different about the one that DNH has created is that it, it is, uh, it includes a lot of functionality for building what they call cloud clusters. So you can, you know, procure Office 365 licenses anywhere. What DNH is trying to help its partners do is take that Office 365 license, combine it with uh, a security product and a backup product, and starting soon, 
some hardware like laptops, turn that into what they call a cluster and sell that bundle essentially um, uh, on an as a service basis um, to your customer with um, your own services plus potentially services from DNH sort of wrapped in there. Um, so again, it, if you are a traditional reseller, you're looking to get into the as a service model, you're looking to uh, get into solutions as opposed to products, um, you know, DNH and that cloud space is introducing something that's designed to help you do that. They have a, a separate initiative going on in the pro AV space. That's very, very similar where, you know, um, uh, if you're interested in entering that market, you want to do it with solutions, not products. There are services involved in, in especially in implementing uh, a pro AV uh, system where you really kind of need to know what you're doing in terms of where you hang things and how you hang things and wire them up and so on. And, uh, you know, DNH can provide that piece of the services puzzle themselves and enable you uh, as a reseller to provide this kind of potentially subscription price uh, kind of pro AV offering. So, um, if, you know, this is their answer to the, uh, uh, the riddle, the issue that all of the distributors are dealing with now in similar, but slightly different ways. And, um, just judging by some of the growth numbers that DNH has put up, uh, in the last year, uh, especially in those markets that they're really kind of zeroing in on it, it, uh, so far so good. It seems to be, uh, working for them. Yeah. This is the, Third show in a row, I think we've talked a little bit about Pro AV. Is there really a lot of um, a lot of partners dabbling now? Who, who traditional IT resellers, MSPs, getting into Pro AV more and more? Um, I, I think it's. Uh, I mean, this this is my sense of things. So I, I've um, spoken about this within the last six months or so with um, Cinex and Ingram Micro. And DNH, I can't even remember if Tech Data is in that group as well or not. I think not, but um, I, I mean the gist of what I pick up from these conversations is that it's not like a, a torrent of partners who are clamoring to get into Pro AV right now, but the distributors really feel like that is a big opportunity for the resellers. So I, I think where we're at right now is distributors trying to make it easier for their partners to get into Pro AV so that. Um, you know, the partners obviously can grow their business, but the distributors can also grow their business by generating more uh, uh, pro AV solution sales. So I, I, don't, I don't think it's big numbers yet, um, but I think all of these companies have efforts underway to really sort of um, ease the way into that market and to help partners understand why they might want to get in. It, it, it's more of a priority on the distributor side of the relationship maybe than the reseller side. Yeah, well, where the distributors go, the partners often follow. And we, we've, we've talked a lot about and witnessed a lot of uh, merging of the print, print market and IT, especially as print has become more IT-centric. So it's been a natural evolution for, for them to in, do more in print and more, and more networking stuff for, for print people as well. So like, those are kind of coming together. I just, I, it's interesting to see if the, if the AV and IT side will come together but I guess everything is kind of becoming very IT centric, isn't it? Everything's on a network now, right? That's, that's absolutely right. And that, that's, you know, that's what's driving the, the channel convergence. And it's also what's making it um, more practical for uh, an IT provider to, to get into pro AV and, you know, for the, your, your pro AV competitor potentially up the street to get into IT. So yeah, these, these things are definitely coming together because of how IT and IP based all this stuff is. Well, in hell, I mean, if you're, if you're an IT reseller and you don't know anything about pro AV, but if the distributor offers it, you could still sell it and just make them install it. Right. Cause they'll do that for you. Yeah, well, exactly. And that's, that's, you know, part of the DNH offer. And you see this from the other distributors as well um, is uh, they, they can provide a lot of the services. You don't know how to deliver um, essentially. And it, it's a similar thing. We've talked before about, you know, managed print. Um, you can outsource a lot of the services, piece of that uh, to a distributor if that's something that you want to get into either to, you know, because you want to make more money or you want to keep the print partners out of your uh, customer accounts. It, yeah, it's... Um, you, and that, you that's the reason why you want to do it, right? If, if you can provide the print stuff, there's not somebody in there saying that they can deliver what you're delivering, right? Right. Yeah. 
But, well, that's certainly one very, very wise reason to, uh, to, to look into that. And, and the other is just that um, it, it's, uh, you know, a, a, another hunk of customer wallet, basically, for you to capture. Um, if, if you're not doing that now, you should be doing it because otherwise you're leaving money on the table. You should always, always grab your customer's wallets. Yes. Especially during sales meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Wise advice from Ken. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, don't take that literally, folks. Don't actually reach into the, the pants or purse of someone that you're working with and actually take their wallet. They won't like that. You will not get the sale. Sales tip. <laughs> sales, sales tip. Don't pick your customer's pocket. <laughs> Never works. It's a good skill to get good at, though. You can, you yeah. can use that one on the streets. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably not the best ideas. Um, but uh, the right workspace, though, can lead to better ideas, particularly better ideas than pickpocketing. <laughs> so this, uh, we, we are alluding here to a, uh, a piece, a contributed piece uh, from a company called Steelcase that recently went up uh, on our website. Uh, and I'll, I'll get into the specifics of what they um, talked about and why I think you in particular, Matt, may find this kind of interesting. But I'll just note, when when I first got this, um, it, it was it, it, this was sent to me, pitched to me, essentially as something that they were making available to us. We we would like to contribute an article to uh, uh, to Channel Pro about um, meeting spaces and furniture in meeting spaces. That's what Steelcase does basically is they they make furnishings for meeting spaces, and there are you know technology kind of tie-ins to that in terms of how the furniture connects to uh, an audiovisual system and so on. But I mean, essentially that Steelcase is a furniture company and it's like, why in the world would um, we be talking about furniture? But um, if, if think of this, man, I know we were just talking um, very recently, maybe uh, a day or two ago about um, how you have often said that there, there is money to be made for our readers in accessories, right? Um, so if you're selling PCs, uh, you really should be adding on to that sale some of the accessories, the, the stands and the keyboards and the mice and and uh, and all that good stuff that kind of goes along with the PC. That that's a way to increase the deal size and it's stuff that your customer needs and, and appreciates getting. If you're in the pro AV space or even if you're just into VoIP and collaboration solutions, why not think about um, the office room furnishings? And and part of how I got connected to Steelcase in particular is they have recently, uh, just at some point this year, I forget when exactly, but within the last um, uh, eight, 10 months or so, they have signed a, uh, a relationship with Ingram Micro. So they're now part of the you know, Ingram Micro line car. Um, so a, a very different, a very unconventional kind of uh, accessory opportunity um, for channel pros out there. And so what this article talks about basically is how to design a successful meeting space if, if you're um, goal in a meeting space is not just to enable people to sit in a room together for an hour, but to enable them to communicate effectively and in particular to think creatively and, and solve problems and come up with new products uh, you know, more efficiently Then you need to think about how you design the room and what kind of um, chairs, for example, you, you put in there. There's been some research apparently in terms of uh, you know, not making people too comfortable uh, in their chair if you want them to, to be alert and so on. The article goes into all this. Um, so they have some interesting thoughts to share basically on, on how to, uh, uh, to furnish a, a meeting space. But, um, but a big part of why I thought we would talk about it on the uh, podcast here is just that it kind of highlights a, uh, like I said, unconventional add-on uh, or accessory opportunity for uh, people out there who are really thinking about that meeting room solely from an IT standpoint today? Uh, there has been at least one or more events where I have actually, when I've talked about add-ons and peripherals and some of the most profitable, and I, and I believe at least in one of them, I yeah. said, uh, I, I made people guess what the most profitable add-on is. And it is furniture. Furniture is the most margin-heavy uh, peripheral, if you will, that you can sell. Now, I think when I made that discussion, I was talking about more in the sense of like office chairs and desks. Um, Cause that's something that you would think about as an IT person, not necessarily designing an entire meeting space or a collaborative meeting space. Um, like you're not, you're not, you're not uh, office decorators. You know, there's companies de the, the, uh, completely focused on um, office space decoration. Right. But if you, 
this is great. And I totally recommend people read this. Um, I, I don't know if I buy all of what they've said in this. I, I did read it. And I, some of it's a little new agey garbledy gook to me. But, mm-hmm. but what, what is important is that if you have the opportunity and you, if it's at the top of your mind to sell any kind of furniture product, you will make a ton of money, tons of money. There is so much margin, 200, 300 points often worth of margin in this kind of stuff. Um, so it, it, why not, why not sell it? Right. Money on the table. And again, I mean, if you're an Ingram partner, you can, you know, get this stuff from the same distributor you're buying a lot of other stuff, the rest of the equipment you're selling the, the customer. Uh, it, so it's not like you have to go out and, uh, create whole new relationships and so on. And I should say, I don't, I don't know this for sure. I, I I'm um, nearly positive that Steelcase, um, for example, because we're talking about their column, does sell you know office chairs and desks in addition to um, conference tables and uh, and so on. I believe that's part of what they're doing through Ingram, but uh, I'm less certain of that. Uh, but I'll bet even if they aren't, that um, that is something that uh, even if you're not an office decorator, that that is something that you can potentially wrap into the uh, into the deal. Yeah, no, learn learn about some of this about you know, just some basics on effective meeting spaces, um, you know, and learn some of the jargon walk if you're walking into a room and you're installing a projector right start talking about the meeting space say hey you know what i read research that says if you have this kind of chair you know your meetings will be a more productive or if they can walk around a little bit or if you can do this or and then and be like hey we could transform this space get you all the right stuff money money and you don't even have to pick their pocket (laughs) <laughs> relatively easy money Re- relative to you know, robbing your customer yes and accessories folks peripherals and add-ons monitors mice keyboards all of that stuff that you're that, that your customers employees are touching every single day right and they're right now and, and if you're not selling it to them they're going to amazon and they're just buying whatever they can find for cheap to outfit their employees sell them everything everything good stuff they will pay for it and you will get all that money and there's a lot of margin in that stuff and the other nice thing to point out is you will also get that uh, that little reputation bump that gratitude bump that stickiness uh bump with the customer as the person who came in and not only sold them meeting room equipment but actually made their meetings better like you know they, <laughs> this is more than new cameras we needed new cameras and a, and a video conferencing system but this is more than that they actually made us a a better business and we need to keep these people around. So that's kind of nice thinking about as well. It is absolutely definitely worth looking into. I know some, some, some of you guys might think we're nuts. We're not nuts. There's uh there's, there's good stuff here. Trust us, trust us, check, check this out. We're not nuts in this case, at least. No, uh, we were talking about cloud clusters. We're not nuts. We're not like, I was going to make a pecan clusters joke, but that, that was just going to be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think that one out of my head very well before I went to say it. Um, yeah, so uh, definitely think about workspaces and peripherals and other ways to make uh, to make money because I know every, everyone's got recurring revenue on the brain. And these are not necessarily always recurring. Although with peripherals, you can you can make a you can make a recurring um, revenue business out of add-ons. I've I've uh, read many many interesting case studies of people who um, who have taken like. Uh, um, have done like headsets. I mean, people, a lot of office people have to wear headsets all day long and um, they make uh, they make a recurring business out of that by saying, Hey, give us, you know, blah, blah, blah per month per employee. And we'll outfit them with a, uh, we'll always have a, a, a good headset. If it fails, we'll replace it. And um, then you find a good partner that makes good, you know, decent ones with a good warranty. And it's just money, just bank, right? You, you, rather than just sell them a headset, you sell them, sell them to them on a monthly, on a monthly fee, come up with like the office desk add-on package, peripheral package, right? You know, they, they'll get a new mouse every year, you know, they'll pay blah, blah, blah per, per month. And then, you know, if the mouse fails, they'll get a new mouse and pick a nice one, you know, give them something good that, uh, that, they, that they can feel good about using and, and, and enhance their business and enhance their productivity by having good peripherals. Cause I tell you, Rich, what kind of keyboard do you use? Uh, well, I don't. I, uh, I use my laptop keyboard. Right, that, that's a lot to type on a, on a laptop keyboard. But have you, have you ever used like a nice mechanical keyboard? Uh, I know, actually. I have not. Like a really nice one, I have not. I, I know what I'm getting you for Christmas. 
Okay. <laughs> It'll change your world, man. I'm telling you, you get a real nice keyboard, especially if you type a lot. It's amazing. It, there's nothing like it. You type faster. Your fingers feel better. Gets the juices going. That's the kind of experience. Like, you'll be like, wow, everybody should be using these things. They're great. Mm -hmm. I, I need to try it. I really do. You. I holidays are coming. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> holidays are coming. All right. Um, any, anything else you want to talk about uh, DNH or tech data? I know we, we didn't kind of go into why DNH feels like it has a lot of swagger, but they have swagger because they're confident and they're making money like all the distributors. There, is, there any money, is there any distributor that's not making money? You know what? I, I think the answer to that is no. It's, it's interesting to me. So, I mean, uh, DNH, I think, reported 17% growth in their previous fiscal year. Um, tech data, specifically in SMB, it was uh, 23%. Synex in their like, 2018 uh, fiscal year, I want to say it was 32. I, this is a good time to be in distribution, apparently, if you sell to SMBs. Definitely so. Yeah. Every time I see a story about from a, uh, a distributor, it's always, oh, our revenue's up, you know, a million percent and we're selling more than ever. And we, so it's just eventually, you think eventually that would, one of them would not have a quarter of growth, but maybe not. Yeah. Growth yeah. forever, Rich. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, good. Well, um, we're going to move on here. We got a few, a few minutes left. Uh, we're going to go into the museum pick. So now rich, um, for most people who know, who, who, who know that I have a massive amount of old hardware and software and CE devices. I'm like kind of a technology, technology hoarder. I just can't, throw any of it away. I, I like to call it a hobby. My wife calls it a disease. Either way, either way, it is our listeners and viewers that benefit uh, from my inability to uh, throw stuff away. I mean, Rich, you've seen it. I got stuff going back 20 years, all, all over this place. You've seen the graveyard. You've seen the, you've seen the, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff I have. Yeah. I mean, Did, I downstairs? Did you see the graveyard? Oh Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Good. And so like all those boxes, like I, I, I got boxes. I probably have you open in 10 years. Um, except for a, a, a recent box, uh, that was open not too long ago. And I found, I found a little gem that I thought would be kind of fun, uh, to talk about. Now there was a show a while back. We talked about, um, uh, AOL, right? I had a installation disc for America online. Do you remember that? Yes. And I believe at the time it was AOL three, I actually did find an older version, um, unless, unless I had it by then, but I found a, a 2.5 version or a 2.3, one of the two. Um, but I found, I found one even older, but not AOL. Prodigy. Prodigy, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> this disc, probably 1992, <laughs> somewhere in there. This is Prodigy. This is a Prodigy installation disc version 1.1. 1. 1. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so this one yeah, that, that might actually have some monetary value there. That that might be a, a a true collector's item. It might. This one this one's old. This one really really goes back. Um, now I have to I have to say I I never used Prodigy. Um, I didn't get online until I was other than some dial in BBS stuff I did. Um, but I wasn't really truly online with any service until, oh gosh, 95 maybe. So this was a little before me. I had some friends that had AOL, uh, but our house didn't get any kind of internet access. Um, but I also never used one of these comprehensive services really other than, other than at friends. But I know Prodigy was uh, one of the largest ones for a long time. If I remember correctly, um, by 1993, they were they were one of the one of the if not the largest. Yeah, by 1993, it was the largest online service provider with 465,000 subscribers, trailing only CompuServe. Uh, CompuServe had 600,000 around 1990, I believe. So uh, Prodigy used 1,200 bit modem 1200 bit per second modem connections rich 1200 bits 
per yeah. second. <laughs> Assuming, you know, you were willing to shell out for a, a modem that could handle that kind of speed. That's true. That's true. Uh, the, there were many, many of the modems, um, not by 92, but before, remember that before then it was like the 600 baud boxes that kind of sat on the, on the desk and they plugged into the, to the terminal via like a serial cable. Remember those? Cause there weren't really a lot of internal modems. Back oh no. There were yeah. also the kind the the old, um, 200 baud, uh, we actually like stuck a phone receiver on it. You remember those? I I've, have seen those. I, I never used one of those myself. I, I think my first modem was, uh, I mean, it was definitely, I had a series of external modems. I remember how excited I was the first time I got a PC with an internal modem. I was like, wow, I don't need this, you know, extra box on my desk. But I think my first one was, uh, I want to say it was 9,600, uh, baud. So I don't, I don't really remember like, you know, <laughs> 600 baud or whatever, but, uh, yeah, so we got to translate 1,200 bits per second into modern day speeds. So, uh, modern day speeds for for this stuff is megabits per second, right? In terms of internet speeds. Um, so if if this so 1.2 bits per second, or is it, is it mega? Yeah, it's mega. mega most stuff is still megabits. It's not megabytes. It's mega. Internet speed is sold as megabits per second. So 1,200, well, divided by 100. So 12, let's see, 1,200 divided by uh, 1.2 is one, is that right? No, because it'd be million. It's slow. <laughs> yeah. I, I, can't do the math, I can't do the math at the moment, but it would be like 1.12 megabits per second perhaps or even less than that less than that because there would still be kilobits so 1200 divided by it'd be divided by 1000 divided by 1000 0.0012 megabits per second that's slow <laughs> and of course we're, we're talking about a time where what you're you're moving up and you know back and forth is green screen right like you know forget about graphics there were Pro prodigy had gra prodigy actually had a graphical overlay um, CompuServe did not. CompuServe was command line based. Um, but Prodigy had a graphical interface. It was one of the things that made it stand out at the time. Um, I mean, and how, how, I can't remember, how graphical was oh, it? Oh, not very. I mean, yeah. not very at all. But it had like a dashboard kind of thing with uh, access to the various parts of the service that it offered. Um, let me see if I can find some pictures. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll, I'll put a picture up somewhere, but uh, yeah, very, very, very basic. Um, yeah, I was a uh, I was a CompuServe guy, so uh, yeah. I, so you were rocking the command line stuff. Oh yeah, nice, yeah. nice. Look at you, all technical. Well, you didn't have to be super technical to do that, or I wouldn't have been doing it. But uh, but I I remember my my very first email address uh, in the world was something like. Uh, one two eight five three comma four five seven eight at compuserve dot com. Like they, they couldn't even create you know uh, reasonable aliases. You you had this uh, subscriber number, and they just put that next to at compuserve dot com, and that was it. That was your email address. <laughs> that's awesome. It was a long time. Oh, ago. that's so awesome. Yeah, yeah. It, it takes you back twelve hundred bits per second. Very, the very basics, the start of the internet. Um, very, very cool stuff. Uh, so you used CompuServe. I, like I said, I wasn't online and to, at home, but we never, but when we did get it, it was like a, it was just a basic dial-in service. There was no other service on top of it. Like AOL had their own stuff that they added on to it. It wasn't just like access to the internet. Ours was just access to the internet. There was no no other service behind it. it was like just a raw ISP that was dial in. I believe the first modem was a 14 four in my case, which I probably have many of those <laughs> sitting around here, rich many. <laughs> uh, that'll be a fun one for another day. But anyway, so prodigy a little flashback for uh, all of those of you out there who uh, were first getting online by installing uh, software for, for prodigy. So, uh, that was then, and this is now, and there's really like nothing 
like a prodigy AOL CompuServe kind of thing anymore. Now it's just like internet service provided by various ISPs, Xfinity and uh, what, what are the ISPs in your area called Rich? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's like Comcast and I mean, it, or uh, wave is the one that I use and yeah. Wave. Okay. There. Yeah. So, so now, but there's no like of these, there's none of these like superfluous services on top of you, companies like this. It's now just internet providers and you get online and you go to the gigantic Googles and the Microsofts and all that. That's where all the online uh, services are. So I didn't really have any, that was then this is now kind of thing. Cause these kinds of things don't really exist anymore. So what I decided to do was focus on what you would get access to the internet using. So back in the day, it would have been a, if you were using prodigy 1.1, a 1200 bit per second, probably external uh, modem that was, I'm sure it felt fast at the time, but you know, today it would be like, Oh my God, it would, can you imagine how long it would take to do just a windows update? <laughs> yeah, okay. Like your update will be completed in 7.2 years. <laughs> uh, windows, windows will be gone by the time this update fin- uh, finishes. Um, so, uh, but today we have uh, Wi-Fi as like, the primary way a lot of people, because people are very mobile now and they have, you know, phones and laptops and stuff. So while there is a lot of still hardwired networking in the, in the business world, um, a lot of, a lot of companies are definitely moving wireless as the more primary method for, for endpoint connectivity. Um, and there's a, a whole new wave of Wi-Fi coming out, rich Wi-Fi six is, uh, is pretty new and you're starting to see a lot of the, the new routers and stuff like that coming out using that kind of wireless, um, technology and, and what does it offer? Well, I mean, Wi-Fi six is, you know, uh, has more bandwidth. It's 40% easier on uh, the devices. Um, uh, battery, it makes battery life on wireless devices last longer. There's more 40, like 40% more bandwidth. It offers, you can do 12 streams at once. It can do, you know, all of this technical hoo ha ha, but you know, making wireless better. Cause you know, wireless, wireless networking definitely can bog down when you have a, a lot of devices or you're having a lot of bandwidth. So they're trying to make it faster and faster and faster and faster to support all of the phones and TV sets and um, uh, laptops and uh, all of the IOT kind of stuff. So this is kind of like the next big iteration in Wi-Fi. And well, if you had a desktop computer or a uh, notebook computer that you wanted to say upgrade, to the new Wi-Fi 6 standard. I'm thinking more of a desktop in this case. You might want something like the uh, Intel Wi-Fi 6 AX200 or 201 uh, card. So I, I, I don't know if I gave you a, a, a link, did I, Rich? Did I give you a, did I give you a link? I didn't. Um, well, it's not a whole lot to look at. It's like uh, the way Intel and the way a lot of these do it now, there's like a, a little tiny notebook wireless upgrade card, you know, but you just kind of stick it into like a desktop card that again, plug in PCIe. So let me send you, let me send you this and you'll see what I'm talking about. And for the rest of you, um, we'll put a link to this in the show notes or description, uh, rich right here. <clears throat> so you can see what I'm talking about, but, uh, this one is, uh, the latest and greatest from Intel. Uh, it sports, uh, this one also has Bluetooth five on it, but it's uh, Wi-Fi six pre-certified 2.4 and five gigahertz, uh, bands got all kinds of, all kinds of good features there. Uh, two by two antenna <sighs> trying to get some speed ratings on this here, but but if you it, it, like, like with any new Wi-Fi standard, rich, if you're, if you buy a router, that would say, for example, like back in the day, you probably had like an 802.11G network at some point, right? Uh, yeah, I believe so. so most likely, right? So yeah. when, when, when 802.11N came out, right, and you bought an 802.11N router, well, that didn't necessarily mean that all of your devices were, were now using the new protocol. That, that if you had a device with an 802.11G card in it, it was still G and it would still talk to the router in like a G mode, you know? So you weren't taking advantage of all the new technology that the Wi-Fi added. So you had to get 
devices that can support wireless N in order to get a lot of the benefits. So if you have a, a laptop that is, say, three years old or so and has an 802.11 N, perhaps, or an 802.11 uh, AC, well, this is an AC card, but it's also Wi-Fi 6 certified. But if, if you had a, a, like an N card, which you would, a lot of people are probably still using laptops that have an N card in it. Well, you could open up the laptop, because I'm sure it's out of warranty by now, <laughs> and <laughs> pull the card out and put the new card in and um, it would start to, to be able to take advantage of some of the new features and capabilities of this new wireless standard, again, depending on the antenna configuration and stuff like that. But it would still be better than, what, than the old one. And you can do that for desktops too. You put the little card in this. You see, you see like the little PCI card, PCI Express card that you have slapped. You see, you see the picture, right? Yeah. So in, in the middle of that, there's like that little tiny card that's in the middle. You see that white thing? Yeah. Well, that's actually a little tiny card that you could pop out of that and actually install it right into a laptop. So the, so that PCI shell is like a, just a, a, a bigger interface to plug it into a desktop. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so if you bought this product, you could, you could do it either, or you can install it on a desktop. If you slap it in this thing, or you can install it right into a, right into a notebook. Um, but that's it. Then you would get the new Wi-Fi six, uh, capabilities if you get a Wi-Fi 6 router. And I was looking at some of those Wi-Fi 6 routers, which I was thinking about uh, recommending one of those. Those are, there was, a, there was a couple out there that were really darn, there was a $600 router that I saw from Asus, like a home router. 600 bucks, huh? Isn't that crazy? That's a lot of money. I mean, they weren't all that expensive, but a, a $600 router. And I mean, how long do you expect that price point to endure, right? Like, I mean, if you wait six months. Well, I, they were billing that as an ultra, ultra, ultra premium thing. Uh, but they had some that were already cheaper. I, but not, not in the $100-ish range. I don't think I've seen any like, that cheap. But they're like in the $249-ish, uh, $300 price category right now. Because again, this is pretty new stuff. But all of the new Intel um, core mobile processors that are, that are coming out, uh, the 10th generation, though that has all the Wi-Fi six stuff kind of built in. So if you get one of these new laptops, um, it might have Wi-Fi capabilities that if you haven't upgraded your router to the new wi to a, a Wi-Fi six one, it could actually perform better on Wi-Fi than, than if you, than you, than you can take advantage of until you get the new router. So you kind of have to have both make sense. Yeah. Yep. Fun times. All right. So that is, uh, that is my tech pick the Intel X 200, Wi-Fi six adapter for a notebook or, or desktop. So if you got new, uh, new, new ether or wireless capabilities, you'll definitely want to have a wireless adapter that can hook you up to the faster speeds and better stuff. Of course, for desktops and even laptops, wired is still always the best way to go. But if you got to go wireless, go as fast as you can. Indeed. Indeed. Rich, that is, uh, that is all I have. So you can tell us, because you're a smart guy, that's the word on the street, uh, what has been and what will be, because we have a, a weekly column that tells people what has been, and then you kind of like summon the, the spirits and they whisper to you. We always thought it was a mental illness, but it's actually like a superpower you have which is we're, why we call you super. I was going to say, we're back to the super thing. Yeah, this, this, this is the thing. <laughs> well, you know, I, I am not the guy who, uh, who tells you what has been. Uh, every Friday on channelpronetwork.com, our own James Gaskin is the guy who does that in his In Case You Missed It column. And um, he's going to have all sorts of uh, news from VMworld uh, up for you there this week, including announcements from companies like Bitdefender and Fortinet and a whole bunch of others that were uh, at VMworld making various... Uh, kinds of announcements, new products and uh, integrations and so on. Uh, we've got some new firewalls from Untangle uh, that came out this week that uh, James will be writing about. Um, looking ahead to next week. Now, next week, of course, I mean, we, we've got Labor Day coming up here. Um, so it's a, a holiday shortened week, a four day week. And yet um, it is going to be an action packed week. We, we have our conference coming up as we've talked about, but um, SolarWinds MSP is doing the U.S. edition of their uh, annual partner conference next week. Um, Ingram Micro has its, uh, I believe, first ever IoT Summit uh, taking place in Irvine next week. 
And then um, overseas, uh, IFA Berlin uh, takes place. So there will be lots of hardware news next week. Uh, and uh, I, I know already I got something uh, from uh, Acer just this morning. I mean, all the big hardware makers are going to have announcements at uh, IFA Berlin next week. So lots of stuff going on, even though it's really just a four-day week. I like the hardware news, Rich. This is a fun time because you do see a lot of new, a lot of new hardware coming at IFA. So this will be, this will be an interesting news week. Yeah. Uh, but we won't be able to talk about it next week because, uh, next week we will be, as you said, doing our own show in San Jose. So if you're in the Bay area, September, uh, 4th for our pre-day event with 20, if you want to do that, or September 5th, put it on your calendar, make the trip out to San Jose. It's the double tree, double tree. What is it, Rich? The double, double what? (laughs) <laughs> I believe it is a double try. We would have to go to the event site, uh, events.channelpronetwork.com to, uh, to go see exactly which one it is. Yeah. And while, uh, while we talk about it, I will bring it up, but yeah, definitely plan on, uh, coming out, coming out to that. If you're in the Bay area, it's uh, well worthwhile. Go to the uh, website events.channelpronetwork.com. Uh, we get your, get registered in advance. We can take people at the door, but, um, we eventually will run out of room. So, uh, make sure that you guarantee your seat, uh, by going to the event site. I think it's like $99 to reserve a seat. Um, but you get that back if, if once you check in. So uh, it doesn't, again, as long as you show up, it doesn't cost you anything to, to come. Uh, and you get all kinds of great, great stuff. Um, yeah, the Double Tree by Hilton San Jose, uh, 2050 Gateway Place in San Jose, California. Please, uh, please make it a point to come out for that. But because we'll, we have that on the Thursday and uh, we'll be all flying home on Friday, the odds of us doing a show next week are slim to none. So we will, uh, we will be back the following week with, uh, with a new show where we'll highlight what happened at, um, at our event as well as uh, talk about all this great new stuff coming out of IFA and all these other shows. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome stuff. All right. Uh, the email address is podcast at channel Uh, if you have any comments, feedback, um, questions for us, so, something you want to say, uh, please send it to us uh, and we will, uh, we will definitely read it. It goes to Rich and I direct uh, and we'll, we'll check it out. Maybe even talk about it on the air of the a story that you want us to talk about or whatever. Hey, put it in there. We want to hear your voice. Um, subscribe to channel Pro weekly is the best way to just know when new episodes come out. So if you're, if you're uh, listening to the audio version, um, we're on I- iTunes, we're on Google play podcasts, we're on Stitcher. We're pretty much everywhere where podcasts are aggregated. Uh, so you should be able to find us in any of those spots. So make sure you subscribe real easy. And then just the show just magically appear on your, on your phone or your tablet or your computer, whenever you want. If you have a, a favorite like RSS app, um, that's not tied into like a bigger service. Uh, we have a RSS link in the, any show notes page that, uh, you can drop right into that and poof, it'll, it'll work just magically and wonderfully. Uh, if you uh, want to subscribe to the video version, um, I know we, we put our videos out on YouTube. Um, every time we do them, YouTube, you, they have a button that says subscribe and you got to hit that, but like that doesn't really do anything anymore. So you got to hit, there's like a bell, like a little bell icon. You got to press that. And then if you do the two, you will actually get notified when we put new episodes out for you to follow and to watch. So uh, hit, hit the big red button and the bell and then bing, what do you know? You're, uh, you're subscribed to channel per week. Um, if you want to follow us on the social networks, we are Channel Pro Network on Facebook. We are at Channel Pro SMB on Twitter. Rich, you are on the Twitters. You are at Rich Free. And I am at Matt Whitlock on Twitter. Um, so you can follow us there. All kinds of ways to stay, stay connected to, uh, to Channel Pro Weekly. And of course, ch- the website is ChannelProNetwork.com. Uh, bookmark it as your start page. Uh, there's news stories, articles, great content. Uh, white papers and downloads and all kinds of stuff going up every single day, nonstop. So uh, definitely point your eyeballs there on a regular basis to, uh, to stay, stay in, in touch with everything that's going on. So on behalf of Rich, anything else you want to say? Uh, no, thanks for listening. We'll be back in uh, two weeks. Back in a couple of weeks. This is episode 115, Channel Four Weekly. See you all next time.